Thanks for coming. I'm going to be talking about Coop, which is a um, JavaScript application that you can use to connect data really from anywhere into the ArcGIS platform. So I like to think of it as a bridge between data that's kind of sticky. You know, it lives over here. It's not going to move into ArcGIS. Um, but you want to bring it to the platform so you can do analysis and cartography and use all of the, the powerful tools. And that bridge is the GeoServices um, REST API. Um, if you're not familiar with GeoServices, that's just the official name for the API that ArcGIS Feature Services use. So um, if you've seen a, a Coop demo before, you may have seen something uh, very similar to this. But I picked another city. And the example uses about 50% um, less code. Uh, so I, I've really made some changes in, in Coop 3.0 that'll make things a lot easier for you. But let me just step you through this. So um, I know that the use case here is um, looking for an apartment or a house to buy in Atlanta. And um, I think we're, we're all familiar with the, the resources out there for kind of finding listings online. You've got Craigslist, which is got a lot of rentals kind of sparing in, in their display, um, but they, they do have listings. You have Zillow, um, which has got a little bit more information like schools and things like that. Um, but th there's no things like public transportation and grocery stores and things that you might be interested in if you're trying to figure out where is the best place to live. Yelp's got business listings. Things like grocery stores and restaurants. But, but none of these out of the box work in uh, ArcGIS. You can't bring Craigslist listings directly into ArcGIS just by pasting in a, a URL. Well, actually, that's, that's not true. That's actually what I've done. Uh, so with ArcGIS, I, I can bring in data from you know, lots of public sources. So uh, I can bring in um, elementary schools uh, just by searching in ArcGIS Online uh, from the web map viewer. Um, I brought in, brought in grocery stores by doing a little research with Google Earth, saving all of the places from doing the search, and then brought those in as a, a feature service, and then did analysis to see where the, the um, areas that are within half a mile driving distance. So it's really close. Atlanta has really bad traffic, so you want to be close to these things. Um, more public data in here with the Atlanta Beltline, which is a, um, a trail that goes around the city that's uh, really a focus of development. You see a lot of um, restaurants and, and housing, um, walkability and biking really springing up around this belt line kind of as an organizing principle uh, for Atlanta. And then other things that are important to me are pub public transit. Um, so kind of see the problem here, right? I want to collapse these three tabs into one. Um, and that's exactly what I can do with Coop. So, um, looks like this. When you, when you translate a data source with Coop, you end up getting a URL. So I'm going to add in apartment listings from Craigslist right now. So just like that, I can bring in those apartment listings. And this is not like a, a one-time scrape. Um, this actually just talked to the Craigslist API, fetched all of that, did the translation, and it happened you know, in maybe 100 milliseconds, maybe less. Um, so we can see we, we have the, the listings in here. And I'm just going to turn on the other layers. They come in the other way. You don't need to watch me typing out really long URLs. Um, but the value is that I can, I can bring these layers in, and they work just like other ArcGIS layers now. Um, I, I can do cartography on them. I can work on the, the pop-up. I can add labels. And I can zoom in you know, to, to neighborhoods and go in and, and filter. Um, so if I need you know, at least two bedrooms, so what, what we're doing here is kind of tricking ArcGIS into thinking that it's, it's its friend, you know, the feature service. It knows how to deal with this. All of the applications are built around this geoservices specification. 
So once you do that translation, you really unlock all the things that ArcGIS can do for that data source. You, know, you can make charts using um, Cedar Library, you can um, you know, make maps in, in ArcGIS Pro. Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's working now. All right, we'll, we'll find out later. <laughs> um, but you, know, you, you can bring all these tools to bear uh, that were previously unavailable, or, or maybe you would you know, do like a one-time scrape and translate. This is, a, this is a live link, so every time I move the map, it's actually calling back to the Yelp API, giving it the bounding box um, and the search term for restaurants and, and bringing that data back in. Um, same, same goes with, with Zillow uh, and Craigslist. All right, so that's, that's the why. That's, that's the point of Coop, to bring data in from places that don't natively support um, the Geoservices API. All right, so I just want to go over a little background. Um, Coop is a Node.js application. It runs on the server. Uh, there's a lot of code within Coop that can run within the browser, but it is primarily a server-side application. Um, Node.js is just, it's just JavaScript on the server. The key distinction is that it does asynchronous I.O., and that means that um, it, can handle, it can handle a lot of web traffic. Um, if you're talking to another server, uh, Coop will go, or sorry, uh, Node will go on and do other things while it waits for that to come back. Um, there's a lot of good resources to learn about Node uh, from the, their website. NPM is the package manager for JavaScript, so um, Coop is published up on NPM. If you want to use it, uh, you can look for it there. Um, key thing to know, know about NPM is that it installs dependencies. And then geoservices, as I mentioned earlier, is um, open API specification used by ArcGIS uh, for feature services and other things. So um, there's a lot of ESRI resources on that. There's also a page called geoservices.github.io that's maintained by Andrew Turner. It's kind of a friendly example driven page to really understand the ArcGIS API. All right, so um, I mentioned that I made a lot of changes in Coop 3.0. Um, so Coop's been around since I think 2014, originally created by uh, Chris Helm, and he had a lot of really great ideas and did a lot of things with Coop. And what we've done over the last couple of years is kind of streamline that and start bringing back in the good ideas. So in, in Coop 3.0, simplified providers. So if you've used Coop before, um, you may have noticed that you had to write uh, a lot of um, lines of code that may have seemed like boilerplate. To have a feature server as part of your provider, you would need to actually implement the routes for a feature server. Uh, that, that's all built in now. So all you have to do is implement a function that knows how to talk to the remote API and translate the data from that API into uh, GeoJSON, um, which is another open specification, really simple, very similar to the way that ArcGIS does features, um, but it's just properties and uh, geometry, very simple. Um, I've also simplified the cache API, and this slide is even a little bit out of date because now in order to use the cache, uh, you, don't, you don't even need to, to um, really understand how it works. You just need to specify how long you want your data to stay in it so that the cache has become kind of transparent uh, to the developer. And there's a new plugin type called outputs. Um, so Coop is really organized around a system of plugins. The core is very small. It's, it's about piecing things together and making sure that uh, providers, which are, are those you know, data adapters, have their routes all lined up. And um, it, it's really putting pieces together. Everything else kind of lives in plugins. So um, we have this new plugin type called outputs, which will handle a set of routes um, and knows how to call back into Coop, which knows how to call your provider and get the data and translate it back. So, uh, the, the first output plugin is for geoservices, but many others could be created. Um, we're interested in doing things like a, an, an OData plugin uh, to make um, you know, these sources work in um, Excel, for example. So Coop is really extensible, um, and it's been made a lot easier in, in 3.0. So I, I mentioned providers. They're about translating remote APIs, uh, outputs. Their job is to handle routes and translate GeoJSON into an API standard. Caches are about storing and processing GeoJSON. Uh, the cache that we have right now is called um, Coop Cache Memory. It's kind of this naming pattern, Coop dash, whatever the plugin type is, 
dash the name. Um, we'll be bringing up to date the uh, PostGIS cache as well so that you can uh, store kind of a large data um, and, and do fast queries on and things like that. There are file system plugins. Uh, so the most important one to know about there is the um, S3 plugin. It just treats S3 like a file system. And that's important because Coop also does, um, has plugins to do uh, translation, like exporting um, data from GeoJSON to CSVs, KMLs, et cetera. ArcGIS Open Data actually uses Coop in production to handle all the downloads. So um, the Coop ArcGIS Online provider will actually pull in data from future services and then out, um, output it to uh, CSV, KML, and GeoJSON using Coop, storing it on S3 uh, using this, this file system plugin. And then there are just general plugins that let you extend the, the main Coop object in any way. Um, there's, there's a bunch out there. The ones that, that are heavily used are the Coop Q plugin. It lets you just manage uh, asynchronous jobs on, on uh, different workers, the Coop Worker plugin, Coop Exporter. That's for exporting all the files. So we really try to kind of break apart all of the Lego pieces and have them kind of very well tested and, and applicable for other places. And I'll talk about a few of those, um, those Legos. Uh, later on that I think have kind of great application outside of Coop. Um, so yeah, I, I want to talk more about providers because that's, as, as a developer, 90% of your time, I think, um, especially if you're in this room, is going to be focused on providers. You want to adapt your data source to ArcGIS. Um, so there's really two strategies with providers. There's the pass-through. Uh, and that's where you will communicate with the remote API on every request. Because um, you, can't, you can't gather it all, like, or there are limitations uh, imposed by that API. For example, Yelp. Um, Yelp does not allow you to bring in their whole Atlanta data set so that you can just query everything from there. You have to send them search parameters. So the Coop um, Yelp provider will actually translate the incoming geoservices query into a Yelp query as best that it can. There's some limitations. But it can translate search terms and, and things of that nature, um, and then returns it. And, and then Coop will do kind of post-processing. Um, once it has all of the data, you know, it'll, it'll send the best possible query down and probably get some extra data. But then Coop will actually query it down based off of what you've entered you know, in, in the um, web map UI. Um, the other reason to use a pass-through is if you have a backend that is really supports, you know, kind of all of the, the filters and spatial queries and things that you need. People have done like Coop Spatialite providers. Spatialite um, is just a you know on disk database format uh, that that supports you know all all of the queries that you would need to pretty much for um, you know getting things onto the map. Um, so you you have that you know advanced backend, and then there's the cache provider. Um, so cache you just gather all the data at once. Um, Craigslist works like that because the Craigslist API will give you all of the listings for a particular market. So for that cache provider, you just fetch the data and say it's got a, a TTL or, or a time to live. Um, and and um, the, the data will just live there and Coop will do all of its um, queries uh, based off of what's in the cache, either in memory or if you're using the, the PostGIS cache, it'll send those queries down to PostGIS. Um, or if the data is really small um, uh, and, and doesn't change often, you know, might as well just put it in the cache. Um, Craigslist is really the, the best example for that. Oops, duplicate there. Um, so I'm actually going to dive into a couple of those providers now and, and show you what they look like. The difference between that. Um, that uh, cache provider and that pass-through provider. So here is the Coop Craigslist provider. And you can see that there's only a handful of, of JavaScript files here that are really needed for the provider. There's also a server implementation in here. Um, we start with the index.js, and it's uh, a required file uh, in Coop. But you specify the name, uh, whether it takes a host parameter, and so as you see when I go into the code, there's two types of parameters that you can take in um, in your get data function, which is the, the function that does all of the, the fetching and the translating. Um, and then you specify where the model is so that it can be instantiated by Coop. Coop can do its assembly. Um, it needs to know where that is. 
give it a version and the type of the plugin. Because remember, there are five other types of plugins, and Coop needs to know um, what, what to do to it uh, when you register that plugin. So you specify the type there. So model is, is really where all of the action happens. And there's a pretty clear pattern to all of these models, um, especially with, with the cached providers that, that are not really trying to translate a query um, from geoservices uh, to the um, uh, backend API. So there's only one public function that you need to implement. This is the biggest change in, in Coop 3.0. Um, Really, there was no clear pattern. There were some emergent patterns, but there was no like blessed pattern. You have to name things this way. It was more like, how do you want to do things? We'll make it all work. Um, with 3.0, you implement a function, um, a public function on your model called get data. So get data takes in the request object. So that's, um, if, you, if you're familiar with the express, um, Server framework for Node, that's what Coop is built around. If you're not, that's okay. Just know that um, there is a request object that has parameters that come in from the URL. Um, so looking back at this, uh, this Zillow um, example, the parameters here, so this is the provider, and that separates the namespace, and then um, the uh, ID parameter here is Atlanta. For Craigslist, we have a host parameter and we have an ID parameter for apartments because theoretically this provider could handle other types of data, it doesn't right now, but we, I've done the, the namespace, um, the URL namespace so that it could. So these two pieces will be in rec params as rec params host and rec params ID. And then everything else uh, after the question mark would come in in uh, rec.query. So you can see here, I'm, I'm pulling those pieces out. The city and the type are in host and ID specifically. There's no way to change those names, but it's, it's not a big problem. So we build the URL here. And so we're gonna end up with atlanta.craigslist.org slash JSON search. And then I, I just do a little lookup um, because Craigslist types um, change from city to city. So I've just built it so that more cities can be added to this. Um, although most will work out of the box. Uh, Atlanta, Washington, Philadelphia, Baltimore, I've tested all these, and they, they just work if you just change uh, the city on these, which is pretty cool. Um, so it requests the data, and we see that here's this asynchronous code signature, code signature. and once this function returns, um, we're going to call translate on the body that came back, which is just a, a big pile of GeoJSON. So, Translate's job is to take in whatever comes from Craigslist, um, and I'll, I'll show you that um, in a minute, um, but whatever comes from Craigslist and translate it to um, a GeoJSON feature. So we're just walking the schema. Uh, there, there's a little bit of filtering in here because Craigslist returns uh, some really funky stuff. Um, they, it's just a, like a list of, uh, of arrays. Um, I don't know why they did that, doesn't really matter. You can kind of figure it out pretty easily and, and piece things back together and figure out where the, the Latin lawn are um, and then the rest of the properties that you want. So there's this um, GeoJSON, this is a GeoJSON feature right here. So each property that we've, we've filtered and, and we're mapping through gets translated into a GeoJSON feature we do a little bit of cleanup here, not too much, format the dates, uh, things like that. And then we hand it back. So here we finish translating and we have this apartments GeoJSON feature collection. I'm gonna set a TTL on it. Um, and that's uh, configurable, but it defaults to an hour. So that's how I use the cache. Previously you had to implement cache logic. Now you just say uh, the TTL is this and um, if the data is still fresh, Coop will not call back to the provider. Uh, so um, I have a diagram that shows what the kind of overall structure looks like. So remembering here that the cache sits in between the provider um, and the core. So the, the core will call the cache first, and if the data's in there, it'll just hand it back to the output 
Uh, if it's not there, it'll call down to the provider, insert it into the cache, and hand it over to the output. It's, it's transparent. All you do is set that TTL and let Coop's core do the rest of the work. Oops, I need to. Cool. Uh, the last thing I do here is just set a little bit of metadata. Um, this is going to show up later um, in, in the feature service itself. So when we look at, um, look at this URL here, uh, the metadata is going to show up, I believe, this is an older version. But the metadata will show up in the name and the description, what you set in that metadata object on the GeoJSON. Um, there's some other things that you can apply if, you're, if your backend supports um, filters and things like that. You can um, at, tell Coop that these filters have been applied and it'll actually uh, short circuit some of the post-processing which can save you time. Um, I'll show you where that is uh, when I go into the feature server output a little bit later in this talk. Cool, so that, that's a, um, a cache provider, right? that, that one strategy. This is usually the strategy that I use. Most of the time, APIs have a way to fetch all the data. You might need to do it kind of in a few calls. Um, so you just really take that penalty on the first request that you make, you need to warm it up. Um, but sometimes there are limitations and uh, the Yelp provider is a good example of that. So remembering that, that naming pattern. So here's Yelp. Um, and it's got that, that index.js. Um, and it actually has a parameter here, or a, an option here called disable ID param. Um, the ID param is on by default. Remember that from the URL, the ID was Atlanta. Um, and the host, um, excuse me, the host was Atlanta. And the ID was apartments. Yelp doesn't only has one API and it's based off of uh, geography, what, what market it's returning. So there's no parameters that need to go through. So I've said disable ID param as true and host as false because Yelp looks like this. It's just slash Yelp, that's it. So I needed to, to turn those things off. Oops, I think I have this name, yelp.js, I do. Okay, so, um, Yelp also implements that get data function, so that pattern. Um, there's a little bit of trickery here because Yelp only returns 20 features at once, so I've done some splitting of bounding boxes so that I can get back more um, features from Yelp. And the, the pattern is the same. So I go out, I do get data, um, and then I, I translate. Uh, and then I format each feature. Right, so the, the, take the input of a single Yelp listing and map all this to a um, GeoJSON feature. So that get data, that fetch, that translate, those steps are all there. That's the pattern for all Coop providers. The extra things that are here um, are these build queries and build query. The build queries is about basically splitting up the bounding box and making sure I can send multiple of the same one. That's a, a really nice advantage of uh, having Coop written in Node is that I can send off like four requests at the same time and I don't have to wait for all four to come back sequentially. It's going to be that the time that that takes is the time that the slowest request took. Um, in this case with Yelp, with a highly available, highly performant API, it's essentially no time penalty for me to send four queries at once. Convenient. So that's what that build queries is about. Build query is about um, translating uh, the GeoServices incoming query, so you know um, that where query basically, and the geometry query into what the Yelp API understands. Um, so I wanna pull out something specific and that's term. And so I have a function that pulls out term from a where query um, and sends that over to the Yelp API. Um, using the set term. It's just a little bit of regex to pull something out, kind of a hacky way to do, to parse that query. Um, but I, I wanna be able to search on different um, property type, or excuse me, different um, listing types. Set bounds is just translating into Yelp's really weird geometry format. It's like, uh, they do like a 
lat lawn pipe join in Mercator to their API. I, I don't know why they do that. It's optimized for their use case. It's not, um, it's obviously not uh, a best practice as we would, we would consider it um, as kind of experts in this stuff. But that, that's okay because we can translate it. We can always crosswalk from one format to the other. So that's what I'm doing uh, with this set bounds. Um, and their, their sort is uh, numeric. So I, sometimes I look at these APIs and I wonder how the develop, like new developers on the teams actually figure out how to build the client applications. Yelp is not the worst I've seen, but they're definitely like little hidden things. Zillow is, is the worst I've seen. Um, and I could, I could show you uh, what that one looks like. Um, but that, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so we, we're, we're setting this query that'll go back to Yelp. There's no caching here, so you don't see a, a TTL in set data. Um, so we just return back whatever we get, maybe do some post-processing um, with some additional filters and things like that. Um, th there's one little bit of trickery here, though, that I want to show. Um, and that's term. So um, I, I want to use the where filter with Yelp. So if I go back to my example that I closed, um, this might be Washington, it's okay. Um, but I, I want to be able to use where filters in um, the web map viewer. And in order to do that, the web map viewer has to know what, what type things are. And so this is always set as string because Yelp does not return back your term as part of the, the feature, you know, the, the listing that it sends back. That, that's not in there. Um, so I, I have to, to trick ArcGIS here. Um, into thinking that you know this is always a string field, so it's always called string. But um, I'll load it under HTTPS. Darn. Um, give that a moment. Uh, while that's loading, I'm going to show you what uh, Kubezilla looks like. So same, same format, um, we have our model, which is sometimes just named the, what the provider is. Uh, here's an example query that goes back to Zillow. So you fill in all those options. Uh, and I'll show you how I got there when, when I take you through the process of writing a provider. But all of these things that are kind of coded have to be specified. So maybe they've got some internal library or maybe their developers just have amazing working memory. I don't know. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a strange one. All right, so um, this should be loaded, and I can show you why I set this as term. So see, here I can do this. I can set this filter, um, and, and I've set this up as uh, restaurant. So we look here, and I've just done an ask for values here, so that's why you see that, that nice view on the search. But I've done term uh, is restaurants. So where did that equal? Then I can parse that out in the back end. And the, the is is available to me. Um, as a string because and uh, I've told um, uh, the web map this is always a string field, basically. Cool. Um, I'll just mention this briefly. The way to start a server locally um, is to run npm install to install the dependencies and run npm start. Uh, all of the providers that I'm doing now will have a server implementation. So um, Zillow, Craigslist, and Yelp all, all have these. Um, so you can just go into those and run npm install and npm start. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a, a really cool deploy later on, but uh, I've been playing around with something called now, which will just take a package.json and deploy it for you, give you an HTTPS URL. It's really cool. All right, um, so I, I've got a really good resource out there for those of you who are looking to write a provider. It's called the, the Coop Sample Provider. Um, and that stitches together the geoservices output that I talked about that's built into Coop's core, the memory cache, and the Portland uh, TriMet bus API. Uh, I just went through a couple of other providers, so I, I'm not gonna go through that one uh, in too much depth, but um, it's a really good resource for you. If you want to write a provider, I suggest forking, uh, forking that one uh, and just using it as your example. So just implement your own get data function, edit the index.js uh, file, 
um, maybe add dependencies that you need or not, and you've got a provider. So should be able to do this pretty quickly. Uh, I, I am able to write providers with straightforward APIs in about an hour's time now. I know I have a lot of experience from that with that, and I don't expect you to take you that long, but um, I, I think it's, it's very doable now to write a provider as long as you know the business logic of how to talk to that remote API and how to translate a feature, um, you can get that. All right, so the way that I write a provider um, often starts with reverse engineering APIs. I do this all the time, especially with uh, ArcGIS APIs, uh, incidentally. Uh, but, but the network tab is your best friend here. So um, with Craigslist, for example, this thing keeps hijacking my screen. Uh, with Craigslist, for example, I started with the network tab and just loaded the page. So uh, you know, if you ever want to learn any API, just look at a client that's using it and watch the network traffic. I'm just gonna refresh here, so we see all, all the things load in, and then we are gonna see um, the listings come up eventually. Um, some latency here. But this, this JSON search is um, what I found. So I, I just went through all the network responses, typically start by looking for JSON, um, and I'm able to find something that looks like listings. This is the pattern. Um, with Yelp, I actually just use their API documentation, but with Zillow, I looked through and I just found, um, like this is the API call that the map is making to get all the listings back. So let's, let's inspect this, um, and hopefully it'll load for me. If not, I can just blow up that image. All right, that's okay. Well. Hmm. There we go. All right, and that'll take a second uh, to format. Cool, so this is what the raw output looks like. Uh, and it's this weird hodgepodge of uh, clusters and listings that are mixed in together, which is why I had to do that filter in the um, translate step, if you remember that. There was a filter uh, step that was trying to pull out all of these clusters uh, because I, I don't want them, so keep those out. Uh, but they, they mix in their clusters with the actual listings. Why they do that, I don't know. It works for them. Their, you know, their client is um, very functional. But if we, we get past these, we'll start to see actual listings here. So th this is an individual listing, and it's all of them for the city. I, I saw this, and it's like jackpot. This is great. Really easy to write a provider if you can get all of the data in one go. Uh, the sample provider is lucky like that, too. It, can, it just talks to the Portland TriMet bus API and it gets all of the locations at once. Very easy to write a provider from there. Um, so we, we look through here and we get this format. You know, then we have our longitude, we have our latitude down here, um, image thumbnail, posting URL, all that good stuff. That's gonna end up showing up in the pop-up because we put it into the, the properties. So each one of these looks like that. Now that you've seen the um, raw JSON here, you should be able to uh, make a little bit more sense of what that, uh, that function is doing in the Craigslist uh, provider. We'll go back to format feature. And so we just have an object, flat object with a bunch of these keys. I take the lat and long um, and put them into an array at the uh, coordinates position. Uh, and then I, I just parse um, the, the asking uh, rate and the number of bedrooms into floats um, because those uh, are coming into strings and I want to be able to filter, right? The, the types are important because Coop, when it's making a feature server output, will infer the types from what are passed in. You don't have to set them manually. Um, so it's important that when you translate the feature, you, you get the types right. But JavaScript doesn't have a lot of types. It's basically a, a string or it's a, um, float, that's about it. Um, so just kind of piecing all that stuff together, um, that's, that's how we walk from uh, this output into the um, geoservices output. So Coop's putting together all these fields, and then there you have it, we've got our geometry, uh, and our attributes as um, the geoservices spec 
shows. It's not a big translation, just moving a couple of things around, but, but Coop does that for you. So um, the, the basic steps to um, writing, that, writing that provider are either reverse engineer, find API docs, implement the git data function, which fetches uh, from the remote API and translates, Config, configure settings in index.js. You might actually do that first if you know which parameters you want to use. Remember, Craigslist took a host uh, and an ID parameter. Zillow just took an ID parameter, and Yelp took no parameters. So that's important when you're implementing the get data function. Um, it's going to have the same function signature, but that's going to dictate what you have available to you to call that remote API. Um, so and then and then launch uh, your server. Um, so we talked a lot about uh, get get data in detail. So um, I think I will leave this as just a, a reference for you later. But the, the key things are to remember are the function signature with the rec and the callback, um, purposes to talk to remote API, return GeoJSON, and the the cache time uh, is managed there. So just set that .ttl on your GeoJSON, and you'll have access to Coop's cache uh, to save. You know, there may be um, kind of uh, you know, API limitations. The data may not be changing. Um, it may be really big, so it's slow to query every time. Um, keep all those things in mind when you're using a cache. But you have a cache out of the box. It's just in memory. Um, so. It'll go up to 1.6 uh, gigabytes is the, the JavaScript heap limit. Uh, Index.js, there, there are a bunch of uh, settings in here. Um, a few of them are required, a few of them are not. So starting with the name of the provider. That's important because it's going to determine the namespace of your URLs. So the, the pattern is you, know, you, um, you have your Coop server and then the provider is at the namespace slash provider name, and then its routes go uh, to follow. Um, works really nicely for me because I actually run um, a whole bunch of different Coop providers on the same server, uh, but they don't they don't collide because their namespace is all separated at that top level. Um, the plugin type is important. Remember, we had those five, um, four plugin types. Um, the version is, is nice to have because you'll see it. Um, I say it's required. It's, it's really nice to have because you'll see what versions are registered um, and it'll show up if you query your Coop um, server to see what providers are running. It, very useful if it's in production for people who are doing QA or uh, whatnot. Uh, the, the model file has to be pointed to and it's uppercase because it's actually a class uh, that you're implementing. Um, so you just point to the model, and in the example of the Coop Agol provider, it lives in slash models because there's a lot of models for Coop Agol. It's a very um, uh, mature provider that does a lot of different things, um, including having additional routes and things like that. Um, the host parameter, so remember that with the ID. Disable ID param, it's also optional. It's usually not used, but sometimes you, you just have no parameters at all. Um, it's just a, a one-shot API. Routes are if you want to do additional things with that provider. So you're basically just building up a web server to do additional routing. Uh, but Coop will register all those for you, and then you would implement functions to handle those routes in the controller. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that. So these, these advanced providers, um, they, have, um, they have routes and they have a controller. So um, I'm just going to show you what that looks like uh, in the Agol provider. I wouldn't recommend looking at the Agol provider for anything other than seeing how the advanced patterns are done. Uh, it's kind of long in the tooth. It's been through a lot of different versions of Coop, but it will show you how to properly implement uh, routes in the controller. All right. So um, this is another thing that's changed from Coop 2.x um, and even 3.alpha that was running for a while to 3.0 is the way that routes are specified. Uh, you'll specify a, a path. So um, this, for example, slash agol slash uh, id um, colon id will send everything to the host handler. And that's a function that's exposed on the controller. Uh, and it'll handle the methods get and delete. So any HTTP get or delete requests 
to slash agol slash something in the ID position so that that colon represents a variable. So um, that's going to end up in rec.params. Remember we talked about that in the get data function, rec.params will have host and all that. Uh, if you're implementing other routes, you're going to want to implement your variables so that you know, you know how to handle the different use cases for that route. So we've got a whole bunch of these, and that, that's all this file does, is just exports uh, an array of routes that Koopal then um, register uh, and can be used on your web server. So they're all uh, absolute in this case. Um, so careful here, because you might step on another route. But if you're using the same, if you're using the namespace of your provider, which you should, you'll be fine. Actually, um, I'm going to show a, a synthetic example of the controller. It's a little bit more simple. Uh, this is the main docs for provider. It's at coopjs.github.io. The link is in this uh, spreadsheet. But this is something I've worked up lately to really go through in detail all the things you need to know about a provider. Docs and other things will be coming later, but I think um, you know, as, as developers, you're going to be mostly interested in these providers. So here's an example controller uh, that, that works with this example route. So we have this slash agol ID data sets. So really setting up a lot of things that we want to do with data sets. This is basically something we've set up to search across all the things that are in Coop's cache uh, for an administrative backend that we built uh, to, to view our downloads. So here's the controller. And it's uh, another class that takes in the model. So it, it takes in your um, you know anything that you specify in the main model, which could be more than get data, it could be just get data, but it could be more, um, it can call functions on that model. So I'm implementing analogous functions that are get, post, delete, and then they have some uh, private functions that uh, do a little bit of the work um, just, just to, to reuse code. But the pattern here for the controller, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with the kind of um, MVC pattern or you're not, it's the controller functions call functions on the model. They're really just there for traffic direction. The real work is done in the model. So they call the function on the model. So in this case, um, we'll look at delete. It calls model.drop resource, so dropping it from the cache, and then just handles a response. So if an error comes back, we're going to um, send res.status 500, send with the error message. Otherwise, status 200 um, with, the, with the message status deleted. Um, so I, I encourage you to look, look through here um, for these advanced providers. All right, um, I want to talk a little bit about outputs, because this is, to me, a really exciting way that Coop can be extended. Um, the, the way that the feature service or the, the geoservices output works is not privileged in the way that it's installed the Coop. It's privileged in that it's bundled with Coop. Um, I do work for Esri after all. Um, however, any other provider can leverage the same public API on Coop, this coop.register uh, plugin, um, which I'll go through a, a server example that shows this plugin's being registered. Um, but you can. <clears throat> Add any output, so different formats. If someone you know, wanted to have this Yelp API work with WFS or OData or whatever, you could build an output and leverage the same functions that are in Coop. Leverage that cache uh, transparently. Um, leverage that get data pattern. As long as the provider, or excuse me, the output knows how to take in a uh, request and a response object. Um, and then uh, call um, call functions, and then um, return a response. So it, it's really that kind of like that edge, right? It, it's it's handling traffic. It knows how to use Coop's core, and um, the geoservices output um, plugin is the best example. It's the only example, so uh, but it's also the best. So you can see it's um, taking in a request and a response. And then it's calling this.model.pull. Um, pull is like pulling data from the provider through the cache. Uh, that's, that's the meaning of that name there. Uh, but it, it's calling a function on Coop's core, which will in turn call function on the provider if there's nothing in the cache. So th this is, if you're writing a provider, this is the, the Coop function that you would use is pull. Uh, and, and pull, while it's um, you know, somewhat 
uh, complicated in how it's implemented, its function signature is very sim simple. Um, you give it uh, the request, um, which is you know, that same stuff that came in. What is the URL? What are the uh, query parameters on that um, URL? And um, it'll return, or excuse me, um, it'll call back with either an error or the um, GeoJSON. So th this one is a, a wrapper. It's, um, there's not a lot of code here because it's a wrapper around the uh, feature server module, which I'll, I'll call out a little bit later. Um, but the feature server knows how to route based off of a request, a response, and data. So uh, it's doing the heavy lifting here, but I've implemented this, um, the, this function here, and then I've implemented routes. So kind of similar to those, uh, you know, the controller on the advanced provider, um, I've got these uh, additional routes that are here. And these are gonna go on the end of the providers. So um, when we looked at that, uh, that Craigslist URL, you saw slash feature server slash zero slash query, et cetera. Um, all of the other stuff of the provider, the, you know, the, the hosts, the ID, the namespace, all, all that comes first and then this gets tacked on to the end um, after all that's done. So it leverages those same, those same uh, parameters, but the routes are specified the same way. You have the path, methods, handler, um, et cetera. And then same thing, we're specifying a type and a version and then exporting this, uh, <clears throat> exporting this class. So, um, the way that output plugins are created is fairly simple. Handling all of the routing for a specific API uh, is a little bit more complicated. Um, but <clears throat> I just wanted to show that, that it's really easy to extend Coop from the perspective of what you need to do specific to Coop <clears throat> if you have an implementation of, of one of these open source APIs. Um, so cache is also a, a plugin. Um, I'll be documenting out the cache API. I've been a little slow on that because you don't actually need to know how it works. You just need to set that, that TTL. Um, remember they're used to avoid rate limiting and, and they can really be with anything. So the next caches I'll be building will be with Redis, um, which will be kind of just a dumb store. It can you know, store and retrieve data. But the nice thing is it'll live over sessions if I need to uh, you know, update my server. Um, and then, um, uh, but PostGIS cache will be next, which is nice because you can store like big blobs of data in PostGIS and it'll, it'll just kind of sit there and you can do spatial queries and, and um, where queries and all of that. So you can have it like a really big data set that you've, you've done a lot of fetching with Coop to load the cache um, and, and it'll work very nicely. Um, so again, plugins uh, can be used to extend Coop's core in any way. Um, you can use those, they're on the Coop object, which is available kind of throughout um, the different um, pieces of you know, the whole Coop server. Um, or you can just require Coop and use these things and register them. Um, it depends how you want to use them. But the ones that are there today, for example, are the queue, the file exporter, and the tile generator. They just extend Coop kind of in an arbitrary way. Um, and then uh, two Lego blocks I want to talk about are Winnow and Feature Server. Uh, they work together to make this, um, this open source uh, implementation of geoservices. So Feature Server's job is to do all the routing. Uh, it takes in a, a blob of GeoJSON, a request and a response, and it will um, translate that into you know, the, the Feature Service templates that the um, you know, RGS client applications use. And um, Winnow will actually do all of the queries, spatial and where queries um, in memory on that GeoJSON. So if you've got filters, even if the, the backend API doesn't support it, the cache doesn't support those filters, by the time it gets up to feature server, unless you've explicitly told it not to, it'll apply these filters and you'll end up with the result you expect based off of you know, your, your where query uh, and your geometry. So those are, those are both open, open source, available on GitHub under the feature server organization. Um, um, they're pretty cool. I, I, I like these projects. It was nice to split these out and I think Winnow in particular will have uh, some use cases if you're kind of trying to uh, do queries, uh, SQL queries on GeoJSON or Esri JSON 
in a client application. Um, so the last thing I want to do before I open up to questions is uh, show you what uh, a server actual implementation looks like. And this thing keeps hijacking my screen, so there we go. Cool. So I'm in the Coop sample provider uh, right here, and um, I'm just going to show you what the, the server looks like. Uh, so this is server.js. And there's a um, really most of what's in here is a message uh, for you as, as the user. Um, what happens here at the top is um, just some boilerplate stuff so I can hit control C and the server will shut down cleanly. Um, and then I require coop, I instantiate a new uh, coop object. And then in this case, the provider lives in this repo, so I require it relatively. That's that dot slash, just means it's here. If you're you know, using a provider that's on NPM, you'll have the provider name, and it will be a dependency in your package JSON. And then you register that provider. And the register command is also how you would register another cache. So you would do like coop.register pg cache for PostGIS. Uh, if you're registering a plugin, coop.register q. Um, it's all the register, and that type will tell it what to do with the plugin. Use a little bit of configuration here, um, specifically so it can go um, on um, a different port. I don't like to run servers on my machine on port 80 uh, when I'm developing, so I have this whole development thing for my <laughs> mostly day job that runs on port 80. It's privilege. So, um, but I, when, I, when I deploy, I want it to run on um, on port 80. So, Coop will listen on that port, and then you have your web server running. Uh, and then this, this message here is just for you when you use the sample provider, how to use it, et cetera. Um, so I can do npm start, and that's gonna boot up the server, and you can see that I can now run um, these commands. So I just did a, a feature service query um, just to get the count of the number of uh, buses that, that are running for uh, the TriMet in Portland. Um, cool, so um, I just wanted to show you, just introduce you to, I think the new, one of the new ways I'll be deploying providers just for quick demos. Um, Cause I think it's really cool and it, it's very quick. Um, so uh, I just started using something called now. Um, and now basically takes a package.json um, or a Docker file and we'll run your server. So if you're, if you're building a Coop provider, this is a great tool. So I'm just gonna change something here, um, just add a comment so I can get a new deploy. Uh, and I'll run now dash dash npm because I have a Docker file in here too. Um, but it is deploying this for me and this is free. I get, you get 20 of them a month and there's some limitations uh, and it's all open source. So it's a key, you know, key there. Don't, don't use the free version of now for your uh, private IP. But it's, it's installing this provider. I've already got the URL that it's gonna run under. Um, and it's starting uh, the server. So um, I can now go over here and run um, Craigslist slash Atlanta. And it'll, it'll take a second to uh, warm up, but I just deployed that to the cloud on HTTPS. That's pretty cool, I think. Um, so good, good way for you to use demos, and, and it's key because the web map viewer uh, runs a proxy service, and so you can't just run a local, if you wanna test you know, your provider in, in the web map viewer, you can't just run it locally. You need to run it on something that's accessible through the web. So now is a great tool for that. I encourage you to check it out. Um, and the, um, uh, the information is in this deck for how to deploy that. And I'll, I'll, I'll tweet this out later, and it'll be available after Dev Summit. With that, I, I just wanna open it up to uh, any of your questions. Not, not today, but um, the path to that would be to extend the feature server module 
so that it can do um, stream services. And then it would be pretty straightforward. That, that would be the, the meat of it really, it would be um, you know, understanding that spec and implementing it there. Um, and then um, it would be pretty straightforward to drive through Coop. It's, it's certainly possible. Yeah. I think I had a question over here first. Also not yet. Um, most of the use cases for Coop have been read only because the data lives, you know, in this authoritative source somewhere else. Um, but the path to that as well would be to extend feature server um, to include apply edits, basically. And then the way I'm thinking is that providers would implement a put data um, or edit data function. That would be kind of the pattern. Um, if there's enough use cases for that, I, I, First of all, it's open to the community to extend Coop in this way because it's all open source. If I run into a use case like that, that's probably how I would implement it. And if someone were making a PR, I would recommend doing it that way. Yeah. How well does this work with uh, SSL API search um, and like session uh, applications? Does it get tripped up by that? Or is it so you, would, you would need to, so, it, it, Typically when you're doing SSL, your node server is not um, running the SSL. Uh, typically you would do that at the web server level. And as you saw, um, Coop was listening on HTTP 80, but when I deployed it to, with now, just now, um, it was behind HTTPS because of the web server. So that would be the tier where you would do that and you would have the Coop server kind of in a raw way, not accessible um, through, um, you know, the public network. Like the Coop that we run in production is not accessible through the raw network. You, you only go through Nginx. So that, that stuff's not in Coop. You would implement it elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, right there. So is it possible to run Coop in front of RTS server like, like a proxy cache, like Varnish, essentially? So uh, sorry. Uh, theoretically, but I wouldn't do that. I would just run a web server or varnish or, or something that's built for caching. Yeah, I, there was a question over here. Yeah, I had a question about just kind of the future of the product. Like, are you kind of the main developer of this? Yeah, I, I'm the maintainer. Is this part of your role at Esri or is this kind of a side project? Uh, this, is, this is part of my role at Esri. I will say since Coop 3.0 landed and it's, I think I've accomplished a lot in terms of how easy it is to write providers now. Most of what I'll be doing is documentation and kind of evangelism for it. Um, because I, I think it's pretty pretty mature in terms of that, that read only use case. But uh, I'll be on you know, GitHub for fixing bugs and things like that and talking you know, people in the community through adding onto it. But, but it's definitely, um, you know, it's part of my, my performance review and things like that. So yeah, it's part of my job. So yeah, I think people have requested WFS providers before. Um, I haven't written one because I haven't had the use case. I don't, I don't usually take um, requests for providers unless they're from my wife. Um, but you know, you could totally do an output of that or, or a provider from that. Yeah, it, I think it would make sense, yes. Uh, yeah, if you wanted to add token-based security, that would be something that, um, you know, th that rec object has access to headers, so the token could be in the headers, it could be in the query parameter, you know, the way that um, RTS does it as well. You'd have access to that in, in the get data function. So basically, if the token wasn't there, you would just call back with an error, you know, unauthorized. So yeah, you could do token. Uh, well, if there's no other questions, thank you very much for coming out. Please uh, use the events app and rate this. And um, I, I hope to see you involved with Coop. <laughs>